Hello and welcome to WJTS Inform. It's time for our weekly update on the state legislation and Mark Mesmer is joining us in the studio. Mark is the District 63 state representative for this area. Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you for the invitation. Always great to be here. Well, let's find out what has been happening in the legislation as, as now we've been moving some things through. Okay. Uh, and I think the first thing you're going to talk about is the business personal property tax, which in, in talking to people this week, there seems to be some confusion in that, well, that's a, that's a lot of income that the cities and towns are going to lose, mm -hmm. and we've got no control over that. Well, that's not really the case. Well, I, like I'm, I, I, I'm saying this, uh, I'm shocked that there's any disinformation out there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. I've never seen that happen before. Uh, House Bill 1001 is a, it's a exemption of business personal property taxation, uh, and, and as the bill stands now, and it won't, it won't, It'll change slightly before session is done, okay. but as it stands now, and, and this is about as far as it'll go, it, it's a local option, number one, and it's only on new equipment. So any business personal property that's on the books now stays on the books. Okay. And as companies, if a new company moves to town and they, and they build a factory, they've got equipment in that building, currently that is almost always abated anyway on the 10-year abatement schedule okay. that we passed in, in uh, 2011 where locals, locals have the option to have a one through 10-year abatement currently, either staged in or 100% abatement, total local control. This bus the business personal property will be no different. It's only gonna be on new equipment. It'll be adopted, if it gets adopted in a county, it'll, it'll be adopted by the COET board and that's the board that approves the local option income taxes currently. Uh, and, it's, and it's a board that's made up uh, representation based on population. So the cities and towns, you know, have a, you know, it's all census data driven. The commissioners get an appointee, the cities and towns each get an appointee based on their population. That would be the board that would adopt it if they choose to adopt it. Before we're done, there will be, as the bill progresses through the Senate, there'll be added to it some, some ways to offset that business personal property, but out of the numbers that have been thrown out there, and it's probably about 700 million is the actual overall total, because you, you take utility company business personal property out of it first, they're not even eligible for it okay. in consideration. Of the 700 million that's left, about 10% of it on average is new equipment. So you're really talking about 70 to maybe 100 million dollars total statewide, and of that, you know, it would be county by county adoption if they choose to adopt it or not. And they'll be given some means to replace it to make it revenue neutral. Okay. So they may decide they're a border county to another state and it gives them a great incentive tool to help attract businesses. Or they may decide it's, it's uh, cost prohibitive or they don't, wanna, they don't wanna shift the burden to other taxpayers, which could potentially happen. Mm -hmm. But the average uh, impact the, the county, the, 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 with, with it being just new equipment, it averages from two-tenths of a percent of the county's revenue on the low end to the highest county in the state is about 4% of their total tax income, and that would be Howard County, where a lot of the automotive industry okay. resides. And so that bill has passed, passed the, House, the House, and it's now in the Senate, and, and we'll go to the Senate. Yep. Okay. And it'll be amended, and we'll, we'll have one more final look at it. If it doesn't include a, a replacement mechanism in the end, I would say the, the prospects of it, because we've been told, let's just keep it moving, let's get it to the Senate so we can refine it, because the Senate has another business personal property tax bill, Senate Bill 1, that they're working on, that really addresses it in a little bit different mechanism. It gives a, an exemption of, of up to 25,000 you know, you know, per business. Mm -hmm. If you're a small business, that, that would be maybe your total, you know, your total business personal property. If you're a big business, it ain't gonna make much difference. So they're, uh, they're approaching it with a little bit different strategy. In the end, the two have to meet. So somehow we'll end up with you know, one or the other, um, and, and it'll, it'll be set up to where it's revenue neutral no matter how we adopt it, or I don't think the final bill will pass. That's what the governor wants. That's what everybody wants, but the bills you know, have yet to have some refinement done to them, and, and there'll be a meeting in the middle somewhere between the Senate Bill 1 and the House Bill 1001. Okay. Now another bill that passed uh, and is now I guess in the Senate is 
and we're going to kind of use an oxymoron. It's a way to get the government to work faster. Yes. Uh, which is the State Building Commission, uh, a bill that has been passed to help them to move faster. Yeah, and this, this was actually, the government. actually done with their cooperation in, oh, in okay. drafting the bill. So that's kind of exciting. Uh, currently, when you send plans up to get building permits for commercial projects, Normally, if things are going smooth, it's less than a month, but sometimes they can get a little backlogged and it can be two to three months or six months. Um, I mean, sometimes it, it hasn't got that bad lately, but it has in the past. Mm -hmm. And this bill would mandate that they have 10 days to get you a tentative approval and 10 working days and 20 working days to be complete. And the building commission is okay with that. They said, if, if we have to to take, if we get a big backlog and we've got to hire a local engineering firm to, to speed up our process, they're willing to do it. And it sounds good. A delay in getting a building started is a delay in 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 its its lost opportunity, its lost sales. It's you know it could impact any anywhere from a daycare center, you know, to a hospital or or strip mall or restaurant. Everything you know that you know time is money. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we are mandating government, government efficiency, and that's a good thing. <laughs> Let's hope it works. Yeah. Maybe we can learn that and uh, some other things. That's right. Okay, now another bill that has passed and has gone to the Senate is the uh, welfare drug testing, which also has language about nutrition. Mm -hmm. uh, House Bill 1351, is it, it will require uh, random drug testing for folks that receive what they call TANF, uh, that's uh, cash assistance portion of the welfare um, benefits. Okay. If they fail a, a drug test, they don't automatically lose their benefits. They've got to go into a treatment program. If while they're in their treatment program, they fail again, if they have kids, the kids can continue to receive their cash assistance if they go to guardianship of a, you know, of a drug-free home. Uh, so we never want to penalize the kids, mm -hmm. but if the parents can't, uh, can't stay clean, you know, there will ultimately be some, you know, some dinging you know, uh, to their welfare benefit also includes getting um, some nutritional value uh, to food stamp usage. Potato Which chips, I always thought that that was one of the rules, but I guess not. No. Okay. No. Now, for that to happen, we'd have to ask the, the USDA, the federal government, for, you know, for a waiver to do that. Um, but we would definitely want to take that step to see, you know, see if we can make sure they're, what they're buying with their food stamp cards, the SNAP card is what they call it, mm -hmm. that it's got nutritional value. Okay, now another bill that I find interesting is the Historic Barn Preservation Bill. Mm -hmm. What is that? There's a lot of out, out the old historic, uh, you know, wooden barns. There's several of them scattered around the county. Mm -hmm. uh, here, there's tens of thousands across the state. But every year, about 10% of those get, you know, because the taxes on them can be can be quite high. Um, People get to the point where they just can't afford the taxes, so they tear them down. Mm. And, that's and that's a loss. A mm -hmm. It's a loss. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a it's a loss to part of our history. Uh, I mean, it makes the countrysides, you know, quite quite beautiful when they when they keep them, you know, up to snuff. Mm -hmm. There's one as you're going out the the uh, Celestine Road, uh, just in the area of the bowling alley. There's one on the on the south side of the highway that they've done a good job of, of keeping up, and that would be. That would be an example of, of that type of historic barn. It, anything built prior to 1936, uh, the county could exempt them from normal property taxation and adopt just a, a, a what they call a, a flat fee of you know $100 to $500 mm -hmm. because they, they still require some you know potential need for fire services you know protection. So they'd have a just a flat fee that they could pay and, and get them off the, the overall property tax rolls. Can, uh, and so that bill is in the Senate. Passed now, out went, of the House unanimously, okay. went to the Senate. Okay, so they'll so. probably work on that one pretty quick. Yep. That, that seems like an easy one to put through, I yeah. guess. Yeah, and, and, it's, and it set up, <coughs> sets up, you know, for those his, historic barns, it sets up so, un, under the Office of Tourism some ways to help, you know, maybe set up historic barn tours and things. Mm -hmm. There's other little, little uh, additional parts of that bill that are quite nice. So. Okay, now another bill that has gone through is uh, career, and gone through the House, mm -hmm. moving to the Senate. Career and tech di diplomas. Mm -hmm. uh, Different uh, than the, the currently under, currently uh, all high school diplomas, unless you get a waiver, are basically core 40 diplomas. Okay. And uh, that doesn't really meet the needs of, of a good chunk of our students. I'd say you know, upwards of 50% of our students really, you know, don't have 
plans to go to college, a, f a traditional four-year college, and the Core 40 diploma is really set up to prepare kids for that. Okay. Um, they can, you know, they can bypass the Core 40 diploma if they can't pass the additional math skills and things that are required. But and there's a lot of a lot of students across the state, you know, that, that are you know have to get waivers to opt out of that. Well, let's give them a, a career path that prepares them for, you know, for the, the workforce, whether they're going to college or not. And this, this would require the Department of Education to, uh, under the Career Council that we started under one of our bills last year, to develop a, a curriculum that allows kids to have vocational and, and, and career planning, you know, courses that prepare them to be ready for the workforce no matter which career path they're going. I guess in a way kind of the old industrial arts. More or less, uh, but to the, to, <coughs> the, to the current, you know, current job force mm -hmm. or the job requirements. But, yeah, when I when I when you and I went to school, there was there was a a, a large number of our students went through industrial arts, mm -hmm. went through you know shop classes, whatever the term was, and, and that has really you know probably gotten to be less than five to ten percent of our students even have that available. Some some schools in our across our state have none of that available. So hopefully that can maybe bring some of that back. It will. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now now you say this is part of the core forty, but there's a lot of debate now well, about the Common Core, Correct. are the two separate things? Two separate okay. things, All right. yeah. Now well, the Common Core. Common Core was a program set up and, and really it's ultimately the, the Federal Department of Education was looking for a way to get a standardized uh, um, education standard across the country. And the Governor's Association was kind of the vehicle that they used to try to get that adopted. A lot of, most of the governors, I'd say all the governors that said, okay, our state will be a Core 40 state never read the standard uh, and even with you know within the teaching community there's there are good points to the core 40 curriculum mm -hmm. or our core 40 common, common core, core. Yes. Jeez, if we're doing that up, the common core there's parts of it that are very good mm -hmm. but there's parts of it that are just not age specific they're just not age capable uh, and if we have parts of the program we we realize don't work can't work and we don't teach that, then then all of the testing mechanisms, and, and a lot of this really comes down to testing companies and and trying to come up with a cheaper way to, to administer tests. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you don't teach parts of the standards that you disagree with, but that's part of the testing standard that your kids have to take, and your kids don't pass the testing standards, then you really create a lot of a lot of other complications in, in how we evaluate our schools. Um, and, and so we're going to, the Senate passed a bill pretty strongly to, to get Indiana out of the Common Core okay. group. If there's parts of Common Core we like, let's adopt it. If there's things we disagree with, let's, you know, let, let's let it go. Now obviously, for kids that are college bound, if there's parts of the curriculum that become part of the SAT, you know, the SAT test or mm -hmm. the ACT test, we're going to make sure that our education standards include, you know, include those components that they're going to be tested on for college entry ex exams over time, but it doesn't mean we have to adopt the whole standard. Let's you know we, we pick what we like, what we know works, and the rest of it if we disagree with and we think we can do a better job of making our education standards the best. Let's do that. Okay, and that's now in the hands of the house mm -hmm. so for you to look at. Yep. Okay. Well, Mark, thank you very much for coming in. You're very welcome. Uh, it's always good the to week, catch up on what's happening. The weeks fly by. <laughs> they do. And and really, there's just uh, how many weeks left? About Maybe four? Four weeks left. About four more weeks mm -hmm. of the, because it's a short session. Right. All right. Well, Mark, thank you very much for coming in. You're very welcome. Our guest has been Mark Mesmer. He is a state representative for District 63. We thank you for watching WJTS Inform. We are local people watching local people.